All right. I am Courtney Williams. I produce the blog Outlander Behind the Scenes, and I am an Outlander fan, both the show and the books. Um, love watching the show and dissecting it, not dissecting. Yay! <laughs> With these three lovely ladies who I love so much. And um, to, tonight we are talking about episode 510, Mercy Shall Follow Me, and I am drinking a beer. Yay, for Whoa. the first time in a long time. Yeah. And because, in a frosted glass, too. And in a, it's not frosty anymore, but it was frosty. Yeah, but it was frosted. Um, I am Catherine Toomer, a family physician who watched Outlander for many reasons other than medicine. <laughs> Until Carmen got me interested in that part of it. Um, I also write for, um, I write for Blacklanders and actually wrote for this episode. And uh, I very much enjoy our weekly discussions. And I am having a, a hard cider, rose, hard rose, or rose hard cider, I guess it is, apple. Next, I'm Carmen Schmidt, and I write the Outlander Anatomy blog. Uh, I was a professor of human anatomy for 36 years. If I count the years that I've written my lessons and fun facts, I'm now up at 42 years as a teacher of human anatomy. And I love to combine it with Outlander. It's a perfect format to get people to pay attention to details about their body that they might have either forgotten or not known. And I love Diana's books because she's the engine that drives the whole thing and the uh, the ingenuity that has provided us with this storyline. So I've got lots to choose from. And what are you drinking tonight, Carmen? Oh, I am drinking ginger beer. I'm Antoinette Simmons, and I am drinking sangria. Oh, beautiful. And it has strawberries in it. Oh, I'm feeding oh. myself tonight. Oh, let's see some strawberries. I can Look. see them floating. Are they floating? See them floating. Look. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, nice. Beautiful. Yeah. Yes. Looks like blood. <laughs> for a That's very why it's called sangria. <laughs> My overall impression of this episode, I actually really liked this episode. And I. I was excited to watch it again. I watched it a second time and I watched, I liked it even better the second time. Um, I think it's really well done. I think it, uh, it's well written. It was well directed. Uh, it reminded me of the Garrison Commander um, where we get to see what makes Blackjack Randall tick um, with a little Beauty and the Beast twist. <laughs> um, and I thought Ed was brilliant in this episode. And I thought Sophie was really strong. Um, and I thought the supporting cast was all really great. So I, I like this episode. I liked the episode, mm -hmm. but my reaction to the episode disturbed me a little bit just because I was so sad when Bonnet was killed and I couldn't figure out why. I was like, why am I reacting more to him? I had the same reaction when he died as I did when the priest was burned in 412. Interesting. And or, or I couldn't so. figure out why. I mean, it just, I felt like I had been gut punched. Um, I thought there were some things that were a little incongruent, but mm -hmm. overall I did enjoy it. But I did figure out the reason was Ed's acting and Bear's music. When I watched it without the sound, I didn't have the same reaction. I think this was a very good episode. <clears throat> um, the first time I watched it, I reserved... Uh, judgment. And then the second time I watched it, I was able to decide that yes, I did like this episode. 
I felt a little, um, I think, discombobulated after the first watch because there was so much compressed into one episode. And I kind of wish they had separated it into two rather than one, but I realize they're running out of town time and uh, they needed apparently to get this done. Um, but I thought that it was very interesting to, uh, to see the story unfold. And each time I watched it, I've watched it five times now, I've liked it better each time. Okay. Well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Welcome back, Antoinette. <laughs> yes. We missed you. <laughs> we did miss you. I want to love every single Outlander episode. I want to just be dancing and saying yes to every single episode. I love the show that much. But this episode for me, you know, I didn't immediately rewatch it as I do when I really like an episode. I watch it at midnight and I said, no, I'm not watching this again right now. And then I watched it again um, on Sunday night when it came on stars, just to see, you know, if it would grow on me. And then I watched it again today in preparation for us talking about it. And I still came away unsatisfied. It was good TV, you know, it was well written. And on an objective level, I would say it was a 3.5 out of 5, mostly because of the performances of Ed and Sophie. And also the fact that I thought it was well written and it flowed and it was good TV. But there were some things in it and some of the creative choices that I struggle with. And for that reason, this episode will not be one that I will rewatch when I'm doing my rewatch of season five. Okay, let's dive into favorite scenes, Catherine. I had several. Um, my favorite, one favorite scene was watching uh, Roger beat up Ed. Uh, mm -hmm. I felt that it finally gave uh, Roger the edge that was in the book. He's, and, it, and it showed a, another scene where um, Jamie respected him. I liked the scenes that Ed was in. The nuance in his performance was absolutely what I was looking for at the beginning. And I'm starting to wonder if that was intentional that he was a bit coarse and obvious and Pirates of the Caribbean-esque early on so that he could become subtle when he becomes a gentleman. If that's the case, is he, it, or was it a happy accident? I don't know. But his, his acting calmed down. It was, um, it was like not even watching the same person. Mm -hmm. um, but I liked the scene because his, he just shifted from his, his mood shifted, it was obvious, and his facial expressions and his tone of voice and the little boy jumping on the bed, yes, tell me the story, to suddenly getting serious, to then crying. To, it was just, um, you know, it's like that, that, that menacing charm was there throughout. And I just thought, um, I mean, I was like, ooh, Roger who? But, <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to remember that he actually raped her. I was like, oh yeah, that's kind of gross. But, <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> if I had been, if I had been Brie, I'm like, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> but then, yeah, he was brutal to her, so that wouldn't have worked. Well, for Joy, I, I got, I got a lot of kick out of seeing Claire and and uh, Brianna run on the beach together like that. I, I just really enjoyed that little interlude when they were you know, laughing and reminiscing, seeing the whales, um, the comments about that. And of course the setup for Moby Dick, because, you know, I thought when they both said, oh, I love Moby Dick, I'm like, ooh, <laughs> I, it was, I felt like I was put on the Percustus' couch. <laughs> 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 It was 
most murderous to read Moby Dick, in my opinion. But of course, now I understand why, uh, why, you know, what the point of it was. So I love that one. And then another real quick one was I really loved but it. It was stuff in the uh, in Wiley's Landing in the shed, and Jamie pulls out his knife and sticks his dirk, and that's all I could think of was crocodile. Then he, he said. <laughs> That's no argument. This is a knife. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my favorite was the, I, I decided since Catherine does this, I can um, is is a sequence, and it's pretty much that whole Stephen Bonnet and Bree from when she she reads to him, and we see that little boy. Um, side of him and his vulnerable side and he tells his story um, I just thought that was a really um, touching scene um, to see to, I was interested in that you know like uh, whatever that episode is where we hear about Graham Menzies I don't care about him but Bonnet is actually interesting to me because he's a main character and a central figure mm -hmm. so I really liked learning more about him and I thought that was so well acted. Um, and then I, th I thought the use of Moby Dick was really creative um, in this episode um, mm -hmm. and how it parallels Stephen Bonnet and his fear of drowning and how her reading that, and that, you know, it was the husbandry book, but she was just doing it from memory. And, um, and then I think one of the poignant moments for me in that scene was when he asks her, says, I was an orphan. And how do you comfort Jeremiah when he's scared? And then you can just see the hunger in his face. She want, he wants her to do that to him, for him. And it's just, that's just one step she can't take. You know, she can't go there. Even though she's obviously emoting and feeling sympathy for him when he's telling his story but she can't like take him in her arms and comfort him. Um, and just, I just thought both of their portrayals of that whole thing was, was great. And then, and then you can see the exact moment, you know, the next day when she's playing him and he, she's not that great convincing of an actor, but he keeps wanting to believe. And then when he, gets when they, when they kiss and he, you can see the exact moment when he realizes she's playing me and the hurt and then he goes into the rage um i just thought that whole thing was really well done and then my second favorite scene was watching ulysses choke <laughs> gerald <laughs> forbes out and and seeing his you know his reaction to his love for Jocasta um, and just seeing him do something and, and be, you know, like Fergus, it was, it was very gratifying for me. Dispatch the Hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> and my last was uh, when Bree shoots Bonnet in the head. Yeah, that's my third. <sighs> favorite scenes. I thought there were parts of the 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 bonnet brie um, interaction that were very, very good. So some parts of that were among my favorite scenes because Ed was was tremendous and he put and Sophie played off him excellently. Um, that first dinner um, when they sat down to dinner and you know she he, she was he was talking about what to do that was so believable because you could see him wanting to to get to that point because he had convinced himself somehow that Bree um felt something for him and saw something in him i love the the Bree and um claire running on the beach like um, that was, that was that beautiful was. i really liked that that was a good scene um and i liked um the while his landing scene it was a little unsatisfactory for me because i was looking for a little bit more but um 
I like the how the three of them were working their little plan and they saw Ian in the background with the gun hold after they had knocked them out and so on. So I like that whole little, whole little sequence. And of course, Ulysses um um snapping that little turd's neck. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, what worked for you, Catherine? Uh, what worked for me was the editing. Um, I felt that they let the scenes play without chopping them up too much. The other thing that worked, I like to play off certain characters. I just like the, the, the writing and obviously some of the directing, but the way characters played off one another, the way they um, behaved in a given, given situation. There was so much more subtlety in this mm -hmm. episode than I've noticed in the past. Um, and so I just felt that it was believable. The exchanges were believable. Some of it, I just felt like if you were in a room with those people, you, that's exactly what you'd see in real life. What worked for me, I thought it's, it's going to sound weird because I thought that the brutality of the sex between Bonnet and the prostitute was just I could hardly watch it it was so real to me and I could uh, completely understand Bree's horrified response you know she can't take her eyes off of it but she doesn't want to be witness to to it uh, but it was very in my opinion it was done very realistically and then I really uh, thought that the scene between Bree and Effie after Bonnet leaves to go get his coins, um, I thought that was really well played between those two women. And I, I thought Effie did a fantastic job. Oh, oh yes. my word, she Me was too. believable. Yeah. Uh, she just knocked it out of the ballpark. And she was, her attitude toward Bree, you know, she was, she was very pragmatic about it, you know, who he was. Yes, she knew who he was and just don't make, you know, make trouble with him and you'll be fine, you know. But I thought that was very well done. And so in that regard, it worked for me, but not in a happy way. It was just, to me, it was just blew my mind. I thought that the short little bit uh, when Bonnet was meeting with Forbes was very helpful in tying together mm -hmm. how they were going to get this little boy, what was the plan, how they were going to get him in River Run. And Forbes explained he had gone out and procured all the witnesses and they were going to sign their affidavits and he was going to take them to the magistrate, get a signature that he is the father. And that that was kind of missing in not completely coherent in past episodes. So I thought that was an important fill in because it is a deviation from the way it works. And it's not quite the same in the book. And so I appreciated seeing that, uh, that tied up. I really enjoyed the, uh, the, the glass blower scene. Mm. where where uh, Claire is explaining, you know, she needs this barrel. And then he gets it when he said, oh, I know what that is. It's made out of brass, though, and has a piston in it. And she said, yes, but this one I want made out of glass. And she had her drawing and everything. And I really liked that because she does get one blown in the books. It, it worked for me to actually move the whole Bonnet storyline into the season and wrap it up. I will miss Ed, but I felt it was done well. So that worked. Um, I thought it was really good also that they showed the motivation for why Gerald Forbes would be doing this. Mm -hmm. um, that piece was kind of missing before. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt that was, you know, well done by whoever decided all the elements. Supposedly it's the team that does that. And then the writer puts in the dialogue and all that stuff and the scenes. But uh, um, I thought that was a good addition. And they did it really. And, and that was also that scene introduced Epi or Epi Pen, as I like to call her. And, <laughs> you, know, 
you know, her watching Bonnet and what and knowing when he was ready for her, mm -hmm. it made you know they had a relationship, mm -hmm. and that she knew, you know, knew this guy. I thought that was a good vehicle. Yeah. The suspense, the music. I loved the title card sequence of the cobbler making her lift. The lift. Yeah, I yeah. thought that was really creative. I also liked the Claire and Brie joyful beach scenes. I mean, you, Katrina's face just looked like a mother so happy. Like, I'm here with my daughter. Who gets these moments? And it's so wonderful. And I liked when when he mentioned, when he had Claire and he mentioned Brie and she jabs a knife at him. And then she mentions Jemmy and she does the same thing. To me, that wasn't that, you know, boss stuff that was like a mother who's like, I'm, I, I know I can't kill you, but I'm going to. Mm. Try. Yeah. yeah. What worked for me? Well, actually, um, I thought the episode was very well written. Well written, yes. Um, some of these, and I like how the, the creative adaptation, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the, the create some of the creative choices I thought were very good because it was a big chunk of story that they managed to adapt into this episode. Some things I didn't like, but I thought overall it was a good attempt to get those parts of the story and put it into an episode. I also liked how they are continuing to show the development of the Roger Jamie dynamic and how that is evolving and changing. We saw a lot of that in the previous episode and I like that they, they threaded that through. And I'm also liking um, how a lot of the hu Jamie's humor from the books is coming across. He's more looking more and more like um, the Jamie that Diana wrote. So, you know, um, threading through his humorous, his, his, his deathbed <laughs> kind of morbid humor um, is something that's definitely working for me um, in this episode and in the previous ones. I also liked how the, I think it has, I don't even know if it's just a function of how the writing was done, but the, everything flowed. You know, in past episodes, we have had this choppiness, maybe a combination of everything, but the scenes did flow and they did give time for the scenes to, to evolve rather than just chopping them off as we have seen before. So the whole, the whole episode had a nice flow and pacing to it. And the costuming, I don't know, this, this, mm who is doing the costuming she is throwing down oh yeah oh my goodness those coats did you yes. see Cesar's outfit in the previous episode that capey leathery brown thing I brought uh, that up you weren't there but he that it fit like, him like a glove he and Claire, like and Claire in this episode her that beach outfit. Dress. Ooh. My God, her oh, beach yeah. outfit. She, I, I was like, holy yeah. Moses. That was so <laughs> that, I wonder if that was from the indigo they were dying last week. Last well, that episode. Could be. Could be. Uh, yeah. Those blues and then the ox blood color of Jamie's cloak and then the bluey green in Roger's thing and then the beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and Ian. And, and then so Ian. Well Ian looked good. And everybody just looked wonderful so the costuming is working for me i think we all agree i need, I need that coat i need all them coats yeah i, I was i was looking at claire thinking i'm not a cosplayer but if i were that would be mm -hmm. it yeah i need all of them and yeah that's a, that's that an was an awesome awesome costume, costume. Mm -hmm. yeah least favorite scenes catherine least favorite scenes my least favorite scene was actually the beach scene with Claire and Brie. Mm, a couple of reasons. One, I felt that it was out of place. It was incongruent with the seriousness of what was going on. Um, they had just had a conversation with Jamie saying, if I don't come back, 
if I, you know, going into this dangerous situation and they're laughing and running on the beach. It just didn't make sense to me. Mm. Both of their husbands were going into danger and they didn't seem to be affected. Oh, the other true. was that uh, the, the whales thing looked too National Geographic thrown in there <laughs> that just didn't look realistic. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like that scene very much. I liked this, that I knew it was set up in a way, but I would have liked to preferred it if they were just walking along the beach more pensive because that mm. would make, to me, that, that would have made more sense. The other scene, uh, thing that I didn't like was, again, when Roger, when they had Wiley up against the wall. Yeah, it was amusing. He's a caricature, and it's funny. Jamie looks amused, but they're trying to get information about their daughter and the wife that's been kidnapped. They just didn't seem to fit. You know, they didn't seem frantic. They didn't seem frightened. They didn't seem, they seemed a little angry. But Jamie, I mean, for your child to have been kidnapped, you just seemed a little bit too amused by what was happening with Wiley. The acting was fantastic. The overall description of it was, it was nice, you know, seeing daughter and mother together, seeing Roger and uh, Jamie bonding again and watching, you know, uh, Ian on the lookout. So I'm like, yeah, thug life, fine. But mm -hmm. it just <laughs> didn't fit. The other part that I didn't really work for me was Sophie. I, I, I just was not convinced. I, I, I mean, when, when my sympathy shifts to, to Bonnet over her, given what she's been through and everything that's happening, I, my empathy gene did not kick in at all. I was far more sympathetic to him than her. And it's not from the fact that I'm, I'm a rape apologist by any means or stretch of the imagination. Um, I, I mean, I've treated too many women who had been raped to not understand the trauma of it, but I just wasn't convinced. I, I, I just wasn't convinced. I, I was, my sympathies kept falling on him and not her. And so I didn't like that too much because I, I felt that that was supposed to happen to a certain degree, but for me, it happened completely. And I didn't feel like that was what was supposed to happen. And the other part I didn't like, I really didn't like how they had Ulysses kill Forbes. Mm. Uh, to me, it sort of, I felt like it played into that, you know, like black men is beast trope a little bit. It's like, he's so polished. He's so, you know, uh, sophisticated, so debonair, but ha, huh, right below the surface, there's a brutal, guy who can just snap somebody's neck and I didn't really it just kind of made me feel some kind of way you know if he had knocked him over the head or if he had even stabbed him or shot him or something then I would have been like you know but the fact that he picked him up like and then snapped his it just seems too brutal for the person um it seemed too brutish for the person that he has been portrayed as uh, up until this point I would like to make a comment about that because I think, first of all, that happened in the books, in the book. Yeah. And secondly, if you think about it as a slave, if he had attacked him, even though he was trying to kill Jocasta, well, I knew the reason for anything, it. no, but if he had done anything less than kill him. Oh, no, I thought he should have killed him. It was right. how he, he killed him. He would have been, okay, okay. Yeah, I thought, oh, the killing part wasn't the problem. Okay. It was how he did it. It was like, it was like, you know, um, uh, it was like he was being equated to the, the guy that um, was with Galus in Jamaica. Mm. It's yeah, like, it, it the put them on the same plane in that, in my regard, in, in that, I think it felt in that scene, the way it was done. Um, mm. Mm. I think that had he strangled him even, yeah. just like suffocated him, like strangled him, until he, he died, that's fine. But it was just the snapping of the neck thing. It just seemed too brutal for the type, for, it just seemed too brutal. Um, it just didn't fit for me. I wonder if they, you know, cause they show him when he comes in, he doesn't even look at Ulysses and he puts his cane. Oh, hat. I know what happened. Yeah. You, you know, if I they mean, were just trying that, to show some inner that, rage for his, Possibly, but at the same time, he's a slave. So that was even incongruent because it, it made it seem like he was more of a servant than a slave. A slave yeah. would not have reacted to having that done. 
uh -huh. um, it would have he would have he would have been trained well enough to not even have reacted. Mm -hmm. um, so Except even that didn't fit. Ulysses is a little bit more. He's an educated man. He's an educated man, and he's also an intimate of Jocasta. We've seen that, even if there's. Yeah. I don't know to what extent that goes, yeah. but but that's a thread within Outlander this season that I've kind of had a problem with. That they're kind of portraying slaves more as servants than actual yeah. slaves. They're not yeah. really making it seem the brutality. It's almost like they're they're humanizing them, which is fine because they are human. But at the same time, it it it, it removes some of the. I mean, I I I grew up in a country where we have servants. Like they didn't act like that. Even it's even like in countries, the whole experience. yeah. But I'm saying is even in today. In countries where it's common to have servants, you wouldn't even have seen that today. People who are servants have a way of switching off when certain things happen. So that reaction wasn't even realistic, especially for that time. It's not even realistic for this time. But the scene right after was just like, mm -hmm. oh, I, I, oh, oh, he acted the mess out of that. Mm -hmm. I, I felt that in my throat. I just, I just felt so bad for him. And, um, and I'm glad they put that in there because they seem to have taken it out and given it all to um, Murtaugh. And so it was nice to finally have that. And when he said her name, I was just like, oh. and the first time I watched it, I didn't notice that her eyes were open when he kissed her hand. Yeah. The second time was I was like, didn't so either, she, but I she did held later. onto his hand and he kissed it while she was awake. And that was a clear indication that they were intimate. Yes. And do you, what level of intimacy do you guys think that's going to, yeah, that, that represents? Well, we don't know, do we? Because I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure if they're going to follow the books and, and have it and, and go to the level. Spoiler. Was real, like, <laughs> I'm just announcing for people who want to like not listen, okay. but go I'm, ahead. I'm not sure because I don't see how they could reconcile that with the whole murder storyline um you know of her and Myrtle becoming lovers and then she and Ulysses were intimate I just don't see how they're, they're going to reconcile that so it might be some kind of unrequited love on Ulysses part which Jocasta exploits because she's Jocasta and she's a Mackenzie so maybe or well, she owns him so she doesn't have to <laughs> that's right <laughs> that's yeah. true too and they yeah. but and they really kind of stoked it up same once. time though it did Mm -hmm. Well, I was just um, when Duncan Ennis came in the picture, they've mm -hmm. shown nothing but her kind of not contempt, but kind of like you yeah, know, dismissive, dismissive. Yeah. And and I think that at the same time, they sort of stoked up the uh, Ulysses Jocasta mm -hmm. connection. So mm -hmm. there's a hope. I mean, my thing is in that time for him to have had that reaction for her to have responded the way she did when he held her hand, I think that is, it just speaks volumes. And I don't think they have to spoon feed the rest to us. I hope they don't, because you know, this production has a tendency to think that we to lay a breadcrumb trail to everything and we, can, we just need to follow along. No, we can make the leap intellectually. You don't have to spoon feed us everything. Yeah. Carmen? Uh, what, uh, actually, what? I felt like uh, pretty much everything in this episode worked for me. Um, there were a few bit of language here and there that I thought were out of place. When, when um, if you remember, there, the first night when they're having their dinner, uh, he Bonnet says, don't you think we should bond? Or maybe that was mm -hmm. this morning, you know, yeah. and that was like, yeah, I am not sure that. And then Jocasta was saying water under the bridge and, you know, just very, some um, modern, some more modern type of language that came out in the episode mm -hmm. that I thought was a little distracting. I don't think it was horribly distracting, but I would have preferred had they found another way of saying those things that mm -hmm. uh, might have felt more new rather than just a re repeat of what we hear a lot. Yeah, more, and, more period, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. It's already been said, but 
uh, I remain uh, unfulfilled with with uh, Sophie's acting. Um, she had moments that I thought were were very well done in the episode, but uh, like Kathy said, there were times that I she just loses me. I don't I don't she doesn't keep me with her uh, and her you know the pain and the agony and the fear and uh, one can just imagine the kind of feelings that you would have if you found yourself in that situation and and uh, she her performance always come mostly comes across spotty to me it'll be really believable in times and then there's other times that it just feels um, like she's acting did you all feel that Joe Casta must have been in on the uh, on the uh, plan she must have they must have filled her in because the way that she responded to Gerald Forbes you know querying her about all this largesse that she was sharing with these different members of the Fraser clan, she was like, oh, you, you know, I mean, it was, it just felt like she, like Jamie and Claire had told her what was going on and that mm. she was setting that up to, uh, you know, to, so that Forbes could reveal oh, his, himself. Hand. Pardon? Oh. So that yeah. Forbes could show his hand. Right. I never thought yeah. it, I did, it didn't occur to me that she was baiting him. No. Oh, I thought she was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I, now that you say it, it yeah. makes sense. Yeah. But at the time, I didn't think it. Interesting. Yeah. Um, my least favorite scene was Roger beating up Bonnet on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> We're polar <laughs> opposites. Um, <laughs> and the reason is because I know that Ed Spilliers is a runner. And when you look at those two physiques, and I'm a, a student of Pilates for over you know, 25 years, and exercise physiology was one of my majors, and there's no way in hell Roger would have caught him running up that sandy dune. There's just no way. And then the fact that, you know, Bonnet's a vicious killer, mm -hmm. and, and Roger was able to just you know, he just stood there while Roger punched him. And then he went, oh, and then, you know, why would he be so passive? Out of well, gas. Well, why did he have a passive? knife or a gun? Well, whatever. It, I just was like, uh, that, that took me out of the story. Okay. My least favorite scene was the scene with Ed um, and Effie. Effie. Yeah. So I thought... When I watched it the first time, I thought for the first time I'd seen a gratuitous sex scene on Outlander. We already knew that that Bonnet is a vicious, misogynistic rapist. I don't think that we needed to see him have sex with Effie to reveal anything more about his character. It didn't tell me anything more about Bonnet than we already knew. It didn't move the story along. I thought it was, it, it seemed as if, you know, okay, everybody has got their buns out on Outlander. We have seen a lot of Jamie's butt during seasons one to three. We have seen Richard's butt. So, you know, let's Ed's butt. Have it was a nice one, though. It was. <laughs> Listen, that was, that was some good looking butt. It was the movement and the. That yeah, was yeah. So, Ooh, Catherine, but, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need to see it. I didn't think it was necessary. I, I understand. I, I hear you. Was, You're I right. Think it was my least favorite. <sighs> All that I could think of during the scene was there's this old Jamaican song uh, <laughs> about a very small man and a, and a large woman. You know, all I could think of was a mouse on a one dollar bread, which, which is a, a mouse song. and what? A mouse on a one dollar bread. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I could think of. 
my other least favorite scene. Are we all recovered from the, <laughs> of the book? And if one person tells me that that was in the book, they're going to catch some hands. Because mm. these people have thrown out all kinds of things out of the book. Wait, wait, wait. So, Epi, Remember she, he the took scene her? of Epi. No, yeah. so yeah. Brie was on the boat. Book. She was pregnant. And then did he yeah. go grab someone else? And well, yes, she, was already there. Epi, she was already there in the, on yeah. the ship. Yeah. But he had her up against the door, if I remember right. Because he didn't and, have a thing about uh, pregnant women. Right. Yeah, he, yeah. But he, oh, did yeah, he do probably. that in front of Brie? I can't remember. Yes, yes. he did. Mm -hmm. He was there. All right. All right. Yeah, so. so and, but, well, uh, well, Antoinette, it was in the book. No, no, listen, you're already, you're already going to catch some hands. She ducked. She yes, ducked. So don't you dare. And the other thing that didn't work for me was that, you know, you, to your comment, Kathy, um, Courtney, about your least favorite scene being the, 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 the beating of Spieler, of X, of Bonnet. <laughs> you know, I need some more wine. <laughs> <laughs> maybe less <laughs> not being believable yeah. what i wished they would have done is given us a little bit more of the development of the roger and jamie i'd love to have seen roger teaching jamie a little bit about how to do how to use a sword how to fight something because he promised him if i'm going to get bonnet you're going to have to teach me the fact yeah i don't see any of that and I would, and the fact that we saw Roger, you know, saying, I'm going to take Bonnet and all of this foolishness and then beating um, Bonnet up. The transformation, where did that happen? I, I suppose we just have to suspend our disbelief and, and think that Jamie um, schooled him in the art of fisticuffs. And so he was able to take on this vicious, experienced brawler. Well, with, and you know what would have made that work? And... Um, is if what if if they'd shot Bonnet in the leg or something and disabled him? Yeah, then I could have bought it, but yeah. no, just I Roger and Bonnet. No, mm -hmm. I was I, waiting for him to give him a Glasgow kiss because he does in the books, which is and what I think that's when it's a head bump. Head head butt. Butt. Uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's when they butt head. And he what, does that. You, what, what is with you and with uh, with butts, people? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to back to my least favorite scene. You yeah. know, um, and what didn't work for me. I'm doing them in 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 in, in Congress. The whole interaction with with um, Bonnet and Brianna was good, and it allowed Ed to shine. And Sophie kept up for the most part, but it went on too long. It went on too long. I did not like the uh, the dinner scene was fine. The whole Moby Dick part went on too long. The whole the after it just went on too long. It just seemed to me that they they said to themselves, "Oh, this is good," and just like in other episodes, things that would have been good if they had been more disciplined and tighter with them, just went on and on and on unnecessarily. And maybe that's why, Kathy, as it went on, your sentiments shifted. To, to, to bonnet it mm. just it just went too long and it I, I i it was half of the entire episode 30 minutes in chunks i timed it 13 30 three, 30 30 minutes i timed really it. what yes from when to when no I, I i paused from each of the interactions i didn't do it continuously because it wasn't continuous no i got it but what what was the first interaction you started with I started with um with when they with when he had her first when she woke up and she was with him. I didn't wow. start from the beach. I didn't start from the beach. So it was 30 minutes. And the whole Mobic thing was just so clunky. It was one of the clunkier parts of the writing because they mentioned it, that we had the whales and they talk about Moby Dick, and here she is choosing to. You know, I don't like that kind of thing. It 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 just is too simplistic and too clunky and just too unsophisticated. And we have been spoiled in season five because the level of sophistication mm -hmm. and polish has just just um you know gone up exponentially. 
since season four. And so I don't like those things. And the other thing that I have a problem with that didn't work for me. And I mean, and this goes back to Carmen's point about, you know, them using all these modern phrases. There's just that little bit of carelessness that I've seen through season five with some small thing that it wouldn't have taken much of an effort to just get right. And they just don't bother. I don't like that. I don't like that. This, this production is too much of a quality production to let those little things just slide. Somebody should have caught that. And somebody should have caught the fact that Ian and Bonnet freaking know each other. How is Ian going to be the one to be to, to, to pretend to meet Bonnet? Ian and Bonnet know each other. Bonnet was in the back of the, the wagon. Bonnet was there when they buried what's his face in 401. How did they think? Well, Ian was also Bonnet. on the boat when Bonnet and yeah. was also on the freaking yeah. They what could the have fact? they could have used Fergus. They could thank you. They could have used yes. any men from the freaking ridge. Anybody. But yeah. they, Ian, I mean You know, I completely that missed was that. A hole. No, I, I, I got that. I got into. that too. I mean, I got so mad because it's just so freaking lazy. I didn't notice it at first, um, but I saw it was like Connie Sandlin, I think, on Twitter brought it up and I was like but you know, do you know the uh, when uh, when also when Ian steps out and says Captain Bonnet to Duff, yeah, exactly. you know, Duff's why he knows what Bonnet he looks like. Bonnet so it worked both oh, ways. That's true. Bonnet that's would have really known cheesy. him, and he knew and who he Bonnet was. was. Yeah. You, even if you argue that Bonnet, it was dark, and Bonnet may not have noticed Nonsense. Ian. Ian yeah. noticed, but I'm sure Bonnet. Ian knew yeah. Bonnet. Yeah, because he was going <laughs> to get hanged. Yes. So that was my pet peeve. That yeah. was, and on the boat, because he was there when he attacked he right. On, on, right. on their way to River Road. He even he had a conversation with Lizzie about it afterward. Mm. That's not exactly, that's not somebody you forget. Yeah. yeah. A, a production like this, which has such high production values, that kind of shit should not make it through. Somebody should say, you know, no, no, we can't do that. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You know, it is amazing that all nobody the caught that. Things, mm -hmm. All the other little things oh. that they Oh, you mean of the production crew that nobody caught that? No, of the writers that, that was, you know, because. Or even uh, not. Yeah. Was maybe the writer well, season four. And well, that's true. It's a, but it's a different group of writers. Yeah, but, but, but hello. Don't yeah, they should have watched season four. Somebody should have watched season four and said, no, 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 you can't do that. that well, Probably that's one of the reasons why I probably reacted so badly to the. Yeah, episode. I can. See it that. just it just irks me. Yeah, I don't like to see them drop the ball on these things because mm -hmm. so careless. Yeah, you know what I mean. Not work for me, and the fact that we didn't see any development of of Roger and Jamie's um um relationship to the point where Roger um becomes this badass, you know. Because he's a badass, but I don't, I don't know how he got there because he still looked like Roger the Professor to me. Well, the only <laughs> thing that would tell us that time went by is Jamie wasn't even limping after right. his snake bite. I Which was like, I, yeah, I, I noticed that too. And I obviously he's healed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that would have given time for him to have taught Roger some. But right. could we have seen a little bit of it? Yeah, something yeah. Little, yeah, just, little, little, little bit just a little montage. Yeah, something that would have been perfect. Yeah, that would have been little perfect. a little less Moby Dick and a little bit more of the yeah. yeah. Oh, just less a, Moby Dick and less butt. They did. Well, <laughs> but they. No, but I'm they, pretty happy. I got to see. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah right. Right. Epi. Never mind. Right. With the Moby Dick thing. I didn't need the whale and then saying it was a favorite book because nobody, that's not anyone's favorite book. I hate I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, unless you're from that time period and you have no other books, but um, <laughs> so if they just, if they just had her pretend we could have gotten that. And also the connection to the fear of drowning that Ahab drowns and all that stuff. 
We didn't need those other little. I mean, she could have said she hated the book that she was made to study it. I mean, anything. Yeah. But the 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 whales were very unsophisticated. I think that's part of what the huge internet the, were. Yeah. That it, when I said you know, uh, uh, National Geographic. That's what it looks like. Like they took something out of National Geographic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and stuck it in. Oh, they did. did. They did. And they, and, but they, and it was too close. It was like it was way camera? too close. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like that was you were watching. They did go back and on the shore and show them a little, you know, smaller. But yeah. it was like, oh come on, we didn't need all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I recently saw that um, happening mm. at pretty close, and it mm -hmm. was still pretty far. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, you can see it with the naked eye, but it wasn't. Like, you know, they were, <laughs> they looked like they were, you know, 30 feet yeah. away. And of course, mm -hmm. injecting the whole thing about, you know, injecting the whole, mm -hmm. uh, taking care of the earth and all that. I'm saying, wishes, I mean, came from the 1960s. Nobody was yeah. for climate change and no. the earth and all that stuff. So I hate yeah. when you try to horn in modern t sensibilities into the show. I don't, That's I true. That just does not ring true. I don't want to. Actually, in the 60s, the whale mo movement came into being just right around there. Save the whales. That yes. was a. That, that was. was that, that I don't was, know if it was the 60s, but it was later. Yeah, well, I <laughs> I know it was because I was a college student. Because you were there. Yeah. <laughs> I was there. So. But what are you doing, uh, Carmen? Burning yeah. your bra to save the whales? <laughs> What? Did I burn my bra to save the whale? <laughs> Carmen, did you have anything new to add that didn't work for you? I was sorry that we didn't get to see Bree shoot him in the ball. Shoot him in oh. the ball? Oh. Oh, on shoot. the beach. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. So that's that what I made more sense. Have caught him. That would have made more sense. Uh, uh, you know, when, uh, no, when, when he first catches uh, Claire on the beach and has her, don't you remember in the book, yeah. where he shoots him through the ball and he, he runs away to yeah, fight another they, day. Yeah, and, but he, they couldn't have done everything that followed then. He couldn't. Exactly. Have, so we wouldn't have seen his butt. That that's butt. for sure. No, no, I, I mean, it would have had to have been done. That's what I was saying, or what I meant earlier when I said, I thought I would have enjoyed it had it more, had it been done over two parts Episode. of two episodes because they okay. could have put in a little bit more backstory about Bonnet. I mean, this is really crunched if you think about it. I, there's the elements are all there. Uh, you know, when I think, I think it's a pretty deft hand at writing given what the goal was, and that was to get this huge amount of storyline into 56 minutes or something well, like that into one episode. Mm -hmm. In lesser hands, this thing could have been a well, mess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it does display the skill of the writer in, yeah. in this particular no, I episode. I mean, as I said at the beginning, it was good TV for the most part, but yeah. there were some holes for sure. I actually had more I liked than what I didn't like. Uh, so, yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, I had a few things that didn't work and I didn't, uh, even before I saw anything, I didn't like the ending with the unanswered question between Roger and Bree hmm. because hmm. I felt like that was that feminine, you know, she hands hold my gun and, Mm. Bree, you know, you telling me they wouldn't have had that conversation before that moment. Mm. Oh, by the way, why why are you shooting him? Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, it's like, and I feel like he, it it makes Bree a stronger, better person for it to have been Mercy, which is the reason that she did it in the book. You know, to make sure he's dead. I mean, do you see the guy next to him who's already drowned? Yeah. He's dead. He's, he's gonna be dead. He's going to be dead. Um, so, and then it also took away from when Bonnet sees her when he's, you know, on the stake and he's panicking. They have him have this kind of like blank look, like, I don't know what you're doing so that they can have that ambiguity in the question versus him going like, oh, thank God you came. 
you know. See, that's what I thought. It that's that's the impression I got. Maybe it's because I was projecting the book onto it, but yeah. that's what I thought. It's like he was panicking, and then he saw her, and he just like went calm. Well, he went. That's calm. how I thought it too. He, he went calm, but it wasn't. You know, in the book, he he says. He talks to her. She rows out there, mm -hmm. and he says, "You left us late last, you know." And she, darling, mm -hmm. he calls her yeah. darling. <clears throat> and so there's got to be a lot of relief. I just felt that that the way they left it sort of cheapened that moment a little bit for me. And I wish that it hadn't. It's more dramatic, mm -hmm. and it's more yeah. that stars that badass he's, woman. He's a boss theme, um, but it didn't. I, I didn't like yeah, it. Because the title of the episode was that and mercy shall follow me or something what was the title of the episode yeah it's, mercy uh, shall follow me mercy, mercy shall, shall follow me so exactly <laughs> it's sort of like where was yeah. the where was the mercy we yeah. had snapped <laughs> well it's just you know it's that it's that stars theme so things that we noticed anything that's not medical um that you noticed Catherine. Things that I noticed uh, was uh, Claire's costume on the beach. Yeah. Loved it. I mean, just loved it. Uh, I'm not a big costume person, but except for when Lord John Gray shows up. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> They do have but, them very um, nicely dressed, always. Yeah, or or when somebody's taking something fun. off. But um, no, I did <laughs> notice. It. I noticed that. I noticed the satin pants mm. that uh, Bonnet was wearing, mm. and thinking, hmm, they don't leave much up to the imagination. Not really, <laughs> and they're very and then, well tailored. Oh yeah. yeah, that's like I said, not much up to. The, they didn't leave much. Uh, to Fit the imagination. like a glove. <laughs> yeah, boy. <laughs> And I also, the other things that I noticed was um, the music this time. And the reason I noticed it was because it added so much that I just felt horrible at the end. I mean, I felt sad. I rarely feel sad, sad at the end of episodes. And that one, I just, my stomach hurt. But then also I noticed that there's a drum that they're starting to use when Ian with, with Ian and it sounds like uh they sound like Indian tabla drums like uh, uh from the Indian subcontinent and I don't know if they're using that to represent I'm not sure what if there's any Native American drum that sounds like that I know they're West African drums that do uh, the talking mm -hmm. drums but I, I didn't think they would use those and they did it last episode when he or the episode before when he was with Roger uh when he was bearing his hatchet and then again when he was at the um, at uh, Wiley's Landing. Oh, the one other thing I did notice, um, I really noticed, the, like I said, the playoff people. But Forbes, his um, he was always a bit um, weaselly, but this mm -hmm. time he seemed more. Um, I don't know what the word is. He seemed like a snake than a weasel. <laughs> those brown brothers <laughs> <laughs> when he was sitting on the sofa and he was like kind of playing with the stitching and he was just like hmm like he was adding up his 20 percent, looking at the yeah. you know <laughs> picture behind him yeah. and look, he was like hmm, i wonder how much this would go for and yeah. i wonder how much that would I you know if i can have this exactly um and he just you know from weasel to snake yeah. mm. I saw a little bit of <clears throat> issue with them saying that uh, they, when when Bree says, I want to take him to Wilmington and have him uh, be tried by the law, they say, her, her mother says, oh, you know, I don't know that that's a good idea. He's bought a lot of influence in that town. And then Roger says, well, there's, we can get Tryon to help us. Well. Remember, he's up in New York, and they're down in mm -hmm. North Carolina. It isn't just, you know, cell phone to pick up and say, hey, uh, you know, <laughs> Governor Gov, will you uh, make sure that this comes out in our favor because you owe us? They would have had had time to get that message up there and then back. It kind of reminded me a little bit of the Knox situation, you know, how he somehow got the, got, mm -hmm. 
got the Ardsmuir uh, records. Uh, records. Oh, I one more, and that is that I think uh, Bonnet must have learned how to pour tea at Downton Abbey because he, you know, he would. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that too. <laughs> Bonnet must watch that show. <laughs> well, he's in that show. I know. Do you know he told a story? I think that was maybe one of his first scenes on television or on that show, not television. Mm -hmm. And he had to carry a tray. And he kept dropping everything on the tray, and they ended up gluing everything down. <laughs> uh, yeah, he told that story. So what did I notice? I noticed that the Beardsley horse had this episode off. <laughs> he finally got a break. <laughs> Not episode. Wasn't Claire riding him? No. She was oh. riding a bay horse. Oh, that's right. Yeah. We got a horsey vacation. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Respite. And I noticed the walls in Stephen Bonnet's Ocracoke Island I did too. lair. Yes. I can't believe you didn't say anything, Catherine. Well, that, because I talk, I always notice the walls. That's just I know, a but that was I thought those were really pretty. Yeah, they were it was like layered. It was and almost gonna, like, and it was like a Paris bag. Yeah, it was like well like was someone else I read, they say it was like nouveau riche uh decorating. Yeah, the walls were like a a, a plaster. Um and which it was, was kind of cool. It was almost a curved the bedroom. Yeah. yeah. It had a curved mm -hmm. wall, like they were in a yeah. lighthouse or something. Yeah. yeah. Like I noticed the bed lighthouse. more than anything. That day bed was whew, loved it. That's yeah. why it reminded me of Paris because they had that beautiful day bed too, but it was a different fabric, of course. So when mm -hmm. I said day bed, I said, hmm, looks like they look like Paris, the Paris, some of the Paris mm -hmm. cycled for this. Didn't they have one in Jamaica too, in Galas's house? Probably. Maybe. Yeah. Yes, yeah, she did. She was I think so. There was a bay, yeah. Bay bed, yeah. It was just a sign of the times. Okay, medical anatomical. Hello, hello, hello. I know this shit too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mouse on a breadcrumb, what is it? Mouse on a one dollar bread. <laughs> is it one dollar bread big? Yes, back oh. in the day, a one dollar bread was a size of a bread. That was a extra large loaf. <laughs> okay, so the song says, I could look like a mouse on a one dollar bread, but I am here to handle you. <laughs> because even though I'm small of stature and you're a one dollar bread, I've got something for you. <laughs> I'm gonna find a YouTube link to the sign. Who's the <laughs> I'll put it in with the uh, with this discussion. What did you notice, Antoinette? You're so observant. Okay. Observant. I noticed um, I loved Muddy Wilmington. Hmm. I loved Wilmington. I yes. loved all the mud underfoot. Okay. Um, you know, I love that Wilmington set. So I, I I I was I was glad to see it back. I also noticed. Didn't Claire take out her knife and try to kill Bonnet? And he took mm -hmm. it from her. But then when she woke up, she had the knife back in the scabbard. Did anybody notice that? I, did. I thought he, he pulled out his own knife. I thought yeah, he no, pulled she, out she, his own too. And she yeah, dropped hers. Yeah. He dropped hers. But then when she woke up, it was well, back in. It was when she, It was in the scabbard. And she had well, the gun in her waist as well. It was when she walked onto the beach looking for Brie, it was back in her scabbard. I noticed that mm -hmm. night. I thought, yeah. well, she must have picked it up. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I just noticed that it was a bit strange that she had it back in the scabbard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm just being too persnickety. And um, I did notice, I did notice the satin breeches. And I, mm. that if he inhales, he's gonna pop. 
Oh, is that <laughs> called inhaling? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's if he takes too deep a breath, if he takes too deep a breath, he's gonna unless you blow afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! If he's a breast man with epi. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh. Well, um, medical, anatomical. Actually, I'll let I'll let Carmen go first because there there was one medical thing in there that was specifically. Yeah. I mean, obviously with Epi. Do um, you, you yeah, anatomia, which mm -hmm. uh, means unequal length of the pair of limbs. So it could be arms, it could be legs, but usually it applies to legs. It's a pathology term, mm -hmm. and it's it. Uh, we all have it. Uh, well. 70%, I guess, of people have uh, some variation of it a little bit. I do. Uh, mm -hmm. One leg is shorter than the other one. But, um, but if it gets beyond a certain point, uh, you know, and there are measurements for that clinically to, to do, but if it gets beyond a certain point, then it can be treated in a variety of ways. And there's a variety of reasons for it. But that's what Claire was noticed was the way that she was walking and that she was walking as though it hurt her. I, I thought it was pretty subtle to pick up, you know, mm. on that myself, just watching her walk away uh, like that. But Claire's a good diagnostician. Mm -hmm. She got down and she felt her hips and um, would feel whether or not they were on the same mm -hmm. keel. Um, and I, I actually like the scene where she is, you know, putting cards and more cards under her until she gets the lift correctly. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very clever. And that is one way of treating the disease is to put a lift either in the shoe or on the heel. Those were the same shoes she had on when she was in the scene with Bonnet, by the way. <laughs> Oh, you yeah. notice that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I'd like Come to on, see if she her. had a limp when she's when he grabs her and yeah, I didn't go does. back she... to look. I didn't go yeah, I didn't go back to look, but I did but you can uh see it when someone's walking. Because there is it's it's, it's a different yeah. kind of thing. Yes, it's a, it's a different the the limp changes. that you limp forward, it's more of a limp sideways. Yes. And so the hip kind of go back and forth. And that's and one of the reasons why they get back back and hip pain mm -hmm. from it is because the shift is laterally mm -hmm. from side to side. And so if if uh, so I could see how Claire watching her walk away and every time she stepped down kind of wincing that she could get the diagnosis. But um, but what I thought was kind of interesting was her physical exam, actually. Yeah. Was. That was a little bit um, you know. I guess, I mean, you can't put your hands together. I mean, it didn't really show a differential between your hands, but that's fine. I mean, and through all those, you know, all that skirt and everything, it would have been really hard to find the markings um, to determine whether it was yeah, coming from they use pelvis or coming now. from her leg. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, even coming from her pelvis or coming from her leg, you yeah. couldn't really tell in that way she was doing it. So, but that, you know. It yeah. did. It worked. It worked for it. For what, it worked, for the and purpose. it was a, it was a clever storyline. I thought mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, to get her attention uh, and be able to say to her, um, "This is, you know, you, when if you can help someone, you should help someone." The other medical sort of thing that I noticed was uh, the kelp for iodine that they were collecting on the beach and the mm -hmm. shells that she could grind presumably for calcium it's not mm -hmm. very well absorbed but it's better than nothing the sponges i assume that she's going to use those for medical uh purposes mm -hmm. i she or you know maybe for baths and things like that but they were uh, busy trying to yeah <laughs> yeah they were busy <laughs> well no you know what Remember, they soaked sponges with with yeah, the oil, and, oil and, 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 and yeah, 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 and also so, or or um, wine. Pansy? Pansy, pansy, oil. yeah, yeah. So uh, you know that would have been one reason why she was collecting those. So that was medical, and then uh, those were a pair of really fine gluteus maximus that oh, I yeah. maximi that I saw on the and the legs. legs and those what? legs. Yeah, we're we're but we're but this is clinical, so be quiet. This is this is medical. This is anatomical. Okay, I'll drink. 
<laughs> yes, his, his thigh, his thighs were really well developed too, and mm -hmm. uh, you know the muscles back there; those would be the mm -hmm. biceps, yes, mm -hmm. femoris, and uh, the semitendinosus and semimembranosus back there. Mm -hmm. So it would be. He's a runner. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it showed when his silk pants. I looked oh, at yeah. his legs and I thought, oh, that guy does something. I didn't know he was a runner, but I knew yeah. he was, you know, that he did some kind of physical exercise. Not Layman's term, hamstring, but most people are like, like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But, but um, you know, oh, the, yeah. the frontal shot to the frontal lobe, there wouldn't be anything left of that. If that yeah. bullet went right smack through his left mm -hmm. frontal lobe. You mean it, it would have been blown apart or? He wouldn't have oh, survived. Would have plowed through it. He wouldn't have survived it. But no. did that look, you know, it hits him and his, he kind of goes back. His head him. bats and then falls. That's pretty uh, realistic. But his, he was still kind of blinky when his head went down. Like his eyes kind of. You were there. I think well, then might have been reflex re a reflex response of some okay. kind. Yeah. I don't think it was necessarily out of keeping with it, but those were not like a regular bullet like we have now. Those, remember, yeah, those were wrong. solid balls and yeah. they, you know, black powder and uh, they just plow their way through tissue. As, mm -hmm. You know, you might as well just take a great big <laughs> screwdriver and push it all the way through, the, <laughs> through mm -hmm. all the tissues. <laughs> and how realistic was the other drowned guy looking? Uh, he was well. He looked like he was like hypothermic. Yeah. I mean, he 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 was. Uh, he looked he was, like his his he cold was blue kind of yeah, yeah cold. Well, I mean, he was so dead, he, right? Well, but before uh, he was dead, even when he was uh, not dead, uh, he looked uh, yeah. hypothermic. Yeah, he but, did. But um, the things I noticed when I then I've noticed this this season across the board, they are portraying Claire as a physician more realistically. Yes, um, I agree. She just her her. Her bedside manner has improved tremendously, even if yes. Jamie didn't agree last episode. <laughs> um, but she she just seems more like true, you know, that feeling of walking through a grocery store and seeing people and just like, oh, it takes every ounce of self control not to ask someone like, do you know you have a thyroid condition? You know, because you just don't know if they know, you know. Right. But you right. notice things. You just notice things when you're out, and and in a situation like that. It, it, and eat, no matter what the situation you're in, you will notice. And so the fact that she's worrying about her daughter and she still sees a clinical issue that um, she hones in on. And not just as a reason to get the woman to help her, but just because she notices. The other thing I noticed was the syringe. I, I didn't quite understand the explanation that glass is easier to clean than brass. Um, in that at that time, um, it just you can seemed boil like, it. Yeah, well, it just and get well. It, it can be cleaned, but I mean, you can boil brass too. I mean, if you have a if you have a tube and a plunger that you can separate and put together, whatever. I just um, it just seemed like having an option that was more sturdy would have made more sense in that time, mm -hmm. uh, rather than trying to make a syringe out of glass. Yeah, I because um, I think though, the seam you they were seamed. And stuff gets caught in the seams and oh, okay. of the of the metal, and I think it would be. I mean, I think you if could that were the case, then yeah. But, but if it could, if you could do a, a a a solid tube, you know, then I guess maybe if it seemed, then yeah, that makes sense. But I did like the fact that um, they're using breeze engineering. They showed the drawing, and it was very uh, realistic and. Um, uh, and then trying to figure out how they're going to get a hypodermic needle. One other anatomical <laughs> thing I can comment on that, and that is that Brie is really, or Sophie is fleet of foot. Did you see yeah. her run from Bonnet? I mean, she really took off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She was galloping. <laughs> yeah. She's faster than Roger. Yes. <laughs> she is faster than she's Roger. She's a dancer. She, she's a dancer. Yeah, she yeah. is. Got a dancer's physique for sure. Yeah. Um, she's got a nice well, book too. Yeah. Yes. I actually thought that Brie, uh, you know, Sophie and Ed make a really nice couple. Um, yeah. Very. I like, like, I like what their Effie. size is and their, just their, I think mm -hmm. they, they look, look good together. together. Well, Effie had glorious breasts too. Yeah. Those were nice. 
Yeah. I just thought it was very um no, oh, she was very perfect. womanly. You know, she, she was. Like, she had a you guess, you, sometimes figure. you get tired of seeing all these little scrawny the women. I mean it was just nice to see I mean, a nice that, full that body. Part of it, I liked. That part yeah. of it I didn't mind. Because yeah. you know yeah. and then the they other could part, have chosen anyone for that role. Yeah. You know, and I liked that. Yeah. But he the other thing I liked was that uh was realistic. They had her wiping herself afterwards. I'm so sick of these sex scenes where they're just like, oh, step up walk away yeah. nothing's dripping nothing's yeah. doing anything i'm just you know um so that was realistic the other thing though that that it really in a situation where a man is that angry and is able to have sex just kind of really plays into the fact that he's a sociopath and a rapist yeah. to be aroused yeah. to that level while that angry he has i mean only a rapist is able to do that um yeah. And he kept looking over his shoulder to make sure that Bree was seeing, you know, what yeah. she was missing. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean that, he, that, he, yeah. he just didn't get it. And his all. rage, his rage. Just <laughs> physiologically was uh, very telling. But, yeah. but I also uh, liked uh, her biting Captain Howard's yeah. finger, yeah. you know. That is such an invasive thing to, for somebody to stick their mm -hmm. finger in your mouth unwelcomed like that you know mm -hmm. it's akin to uh it's still you know, a violation rape or what, it's a violation and yeah. uh, mm -hmm. you know they were just treating her so awful i actually thought mm -hmm. that was a well done scene we haven't it mentioned was. it but i thought it was very convincing and well done and i thought she was good in that scene yeah really mm -hmm. good it in was. that scene but he, he that would have been a nasty infection if she had broken the skin yeah, oh yeah and he would just human it. bites. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're not they're, they're nasty. Not. What's a mill bone? A what? What if she says she's uh, when they're gonna get the shells and she says, Maybe I'll make Jemmy a mill bone. I a think mobile. She, mobile. Mobile. Oh. Like a mobile hanging. You know, I thought that too. So I actually put on closed captions so I could figure out what she was saying. Yeah. Close gap. Yeah, oh, she, she's a mobile. probably a mobile. It a mobile, you know. Mobile, yeah. mobile. She said mobile. Yeah. So it sounds like yeah. mobile to me. Um, yeah. Did anybody wonder what happened to Jamie when they were in the brothel? He just disappeared. He was looking at the girls. So <laughs> he's getting some. <laughs> And then he just he just disappeared. You didn't even see him in a corner. Well, she, no. Well, she walked off, you know, to follow. I, I'm sure he was back there behind. Or asking behind other women. Her. Or yeah. maybe he asking other women. They, he was stroking his millbone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to okay. lawyerly. Um, so the abhorrent slave trade was legal at that time was was trading women also legal antoinette nope okay the law in the colonies would have been based on english common law so abduction was still was illegal you couldn't take somebody against it, their will obviously there were no people trafficking laws and that kind of thing but abduction was um still illegal but if it's a woman who is being abduct, abducted and then she's subsequently married to her abductor then of course she can't um he can't legally be prosecuted because a, a woman couldn't give evidence in court anyway mm. at that time so it would have to be somebody else who would have had to pers um you know pursue it on her behalf because she couldn't give evidence in court with respect to the um the punishment you know death by drowning yes <laughs> you know there are a lot of people who are against the death penalty um and um i mean in modern times but in those times it was either um hanging or you could be shot or it was like you know death by drowning which they which they opted to use and if you think about it um if somebody i i'm not against the death penalty it's weird for a public defender to say that, but I'm not against the death penalty in circumstances where the person has admitted their guilt and chooses the death penalty. That has happened because the alternative to that is life in prison without the possibility of parole. 
that I think could for some people be cruel and unusual punishment. Mm -hmm. These are not, are, not, are not retreats. Federal prisons are nicer than state prisons, but state prisons are awful places for the most part. And to contemplate living out the rest of your life in prison with no possibility of parole. A lot of people would opt to be put to death rather than suffer through that. So in a situation where somebody has admitted their guilt and opts to be put to death, I think, I think they should be put to death rather you, than stay in prison for the rest of their life. Without. That's interesting. I've never heard of the death penalty viewed as a merciful option. Oh, no. Some people have sued states for them to put them to death. Hmm. Because think of it, I mean, a lot, I mean, these people don't understand prison is awful. Now, mm -hmm. some people, depending on the severity of the crime, they might say, yeah, let them stay and rot in prison because that is some cruel and unusual punishment. And death is too easy for certain people. So, but you know, for Stephen Bonnet, death mm -hmm. by morning, perfect. Wasn't that all, uh, reserved exactly for pirates? For people mm -hmm. who did here for pirates? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly what he deserved. Do you, do you think he was patterned after, um, let's see, the associate of Blackbeard? His name wasn't Stephen, it was uh, Steel or Dev or something about. like that, Bonnet, but they, they hung him in Charleston. I remember seeing the plaque on that, and then they buried him in the flats. He was a pirate. And I wondered if maybe she patterned Stephen after that man. Mm. I don't know if you guys saw, she did put up that section from the book. Mm -hmm. um, to, I think to point out that her intention in the writing of it was for Bree to be merciful. Be merciful. Yeah. And, uh, mm. I believe that, and actually, as I'm saying that, I'm realizing it was in that parade article that she said that he would have been convicted for piracy mm -hmm. um, above ad abduction or rape or any of that stuff. I think mm -hmm. that's what they went for. Mm. What about, Antoinette, what about like the whole Jimmy thing, um, oh. the legal stuff well, of him being able to claim Jimmy as his yeah, son? Yeah, that was then, a bit sketchy. That was a bit sketchy. They would have needed more than a signature from a magistrate. I mean, they didn't have legitimacy proceedings like we have now, but in order to establish any kind of claim to a person, you would have to have had some kind of hearing. Mm -hmm. um, evidence in the form of affidavits, yes, but also you would need some live evidence. No magistrate could just sign off and assign paternity to somebody like that. So that was a bit sketchy but I suppose in 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 Wilmington in the early days they didn't have all the legal apparatus so a magistrate probably did a lot of things that and Forbes may have bought him off too yeah you know exactly would have done a lot of things and then as um you know as as Bree said in one episode possession is nine tenths of the law so if they were able to get a magistrate to sign some kind of bogus document and go and grab the little boy then yeah. it's up to Roger and Brianna, and to sue for the, for his return, you know that that could have been that could have become messy. And in that case, they would have had to provide evidence that the child was not bonnet. And I know the only thing they could rely on is the fact that the child was born in a marriage you now, and therefore is presumed to be the the child of the husband, but. Unfortunately, Gemma was born before they were legally married, and the hand fasting didn't count because that's only mm -hmm. a traditional thing in Scotland. So the hand fasting didn't count. So at the time Gemma was born, he was illegitimate, and his mm -hmm. son was up for was up for dispute. So, so the, those witnesses from the tavern who yeah. they would have carried weight then. Yes, they would have carried weight because she did go willingly with him. Yeah, she did go willingly with him. You know, and the, the, the timeline would have worked out. And mm -hmm. at that time, she had sex with, 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 with Roger the same night. Yeah. 
you know. So as as if, if Forbes could have gotten a magistrate to sign some phony paper and they had managed to take the child, because if they did manage to take the child, their papers weren't worth anything. They would have had to been able to physically take the child. Well, like he said, he didn't need her to get Jimmy. Exactly. That's so right. He, so they, so I think they recognize that they had to actually have, you know, physically take the child. It mm -hmm. maintain their legal claim over it. Do you guys think that, you know, Diana contends that the reason Bree chose to have the law convict him was to save Roger and Jamie the stain on their souls of killing yeah, him? Yeah, I agree. What do you think about that choice? I, yeah. I agree with that. I thought, I thought it was excellent in the book, but I thought uh, that it wasn't uh in part of the story of the episode i i yeah, didn't it wasn't it as, well portrayed in the episode but it was confusing you know. when she said I, I let's let the law do this and then yeah. that's the other reason that the that the whole like was that mercy or just make sure he's dead why would you say that then have Instead him kill him on the beach drown and then kill him anyway if it was wasn't for mercy that part didn't doesn't didn't add make any sense because well, she, she I, I also think that she had time to think about it. Yeah, I think I if she had been, if he was going to be hanged, she would have just been like, okay, let him hang. It was only because it was a drowning and only because of the story he told her. But I still don't think that they did a convincing job of creating that kind of sympathy from her based on the story he told. So mm -hmm. if you didn't read the book, you really probably didn't really get it. I'm waiting for you to call for the big themes. <laughs> okay, okay, go ahead. Okay, all right. Well, let's do favorite <laughs> lines, and then we'll go to big okay. themes. Okay. okay. My favorite line was a line and a facial expression. When Forbes and uh, Bonnet were in the tavern, and Bonnet says um, <laughs> to Forbes, are you my lawyer or my priest? And Forbes says, you have a priest? <laughs> the look back was like, I'm gonna cut you. <laughs> you I'm gonna. I'm gonna cut into like small throat. pieces. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like. I, I just, love that too. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, that was funny. And my other line was, "Are you upset because I don't remember your name? Didn't remember oh your name?" Oh my god! <gasps> I that actually was, laughed. I yeah. felt so bad, but I laughed. It was just so well delivered yeah. that I, I actually laughed when I first the first time I watched it. As you were falling <laughs> in love with him. Oh my gosh. Actually, what did it? I watched him in an interview. I don't normally watch interviews of actors, but I watched him in an interview and I realized like his swagger is his swagger. It's not acting. And so then I just like, okay. And then when watching this episode, you could see it. I still feel like the menacing part of Bonnet is actually Ed. And yeah. Ed is also very charming as well. So I just feel like Bon, I think Ed is bonnet without the violence hmm. and hopefully without he the, does he he you know well, they're without the, they're in. Without the psychopathic yeah well <laughs> yeah i mean well the, the, yeah he's not a psychopath but he's very charming and very like yeah, i said which is one of the traits yeah he can he's also very, kind of be in any situation too exactly and, and he's not well. someone i would want to make angry in a dark alley that's no. all i'm saying I think Ed could take on Bonnet, to be honest. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Steven, yeah, I yeah. love you. <laughs> You've been replaced by but, Ed. But I'm sorry. So but, wow. Oh, not, not completely replaced. But. Oh, oh, Like oh, a bad oh, voice. <laughs> Okay, Carmen, favorite lines. Um, I, I, well, first of all, I loved the priest one too. That I wrote that down. But I liked what Epi said. One minute it's whiskey and song, and the next you're breathing blood, if you're still breathing at all. I mean, the way she delivered that was just. I just thought she was fabulous in this mm -hmm. in this episode. Just yeah. fabulous, and I and that is not a, again. It's not a happy uh, quote. But the thing that is so powerful about it is, is that she is saying this is the man he is. Mm -hmm. And then when she says to Claire, if he ever finds out it's me, he will slit my throat. 
And she said it in such a way that it was just really believable to me that she, you know, that she knew that would be her fate if uh, it sh should ever be found out. When he said, I'm missing something, and Bree says, a moral compass. <laughs> and, then she, and then later she says, I, I could never think any less of you, <laughs> which I thought was also very, very good. It's improper for a lady and gentleman to be alone like this. Well, I can have some of my men come and join us if you'd prefer. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> um, there are two sides to every story and you don't know mine. Uh, that was good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when he says, um, I didn't like this, but I, I thought it was a like re remarkable, noticeable when he says, you know, when Forbes is saying, you should lay low. And he says, I'd like to lay low under my regular mare there. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I was like, mm -hmm. what? That, that is so, that would mm -hmm. be so That's appropriate for him. Character, mm -hmm. true to character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I couldn't think less of you was one of, any less of you. That was one of my favorites. <laughs> that was, that was, um, that was classic. And but um, when Jamie said to Claire, if, um, if if they die or something, make sure that Wiley suffers or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Sure that Wiley suffers if, he, if, he, if, he, if they manage to kill him or something to that effect. Because I, I like those little glimpses of Jamie's deathbed humor. There is one other line, though, that I did like. When Claire told her that she could take her shoe to the cobbler, and that to get the lift put under it. And mm -hmm. she said, you know, along the lines of, no, I don't get chosen enough to make that kind of money in order to yeah. afford that, which mm -hmm. sort of went along the lines of the fact that she was his favorite. So there's probably a certain level of, uh, of loyalty that she feels towards him, even though he's cruel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, he's one of her regulars and she's not yeah. obviously not someone who's a regular for many other people. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, Good observation. She, 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 she was fantastic. Oh my gosh, perfect for that role. Uh, Leah Shine, her name was. Leah oh. Shine. Her, her eyes, too, were incredible. You know, there, you know who her eyes reminded me of? Her eyes who? reminded me of Beardsley. Eddie Davis. <laughs> A Beardsley? <laughs> the Beardsley lady with those glaring eyes. She did, yeah. You know, her eyes were sort of that staring. Sort yeah, of yeah mm -hmm. I could see that. Carmen, did you have any other favorite limes? Lime, limes? No. <laughs> limes. Uh, well, I thought, if you fall, Ma Roger Mack, I will avenge you. And he said, and if you fall, I will avenge you. And he said, uh, what a, you know, that's a, a rare bargain indeed, or something like that. I thought that was a nice exchange between the fellows. Let's do big themes. Um, intelligence. Bree's intelligence is what got her through that alive. Uh, she realized rather quickly that she was going to have to think on her, she was thinking on her feet. She realized she was going to have to act her way through this, that trying to force her way out wasn't going to work. Trying to uh, reason with him wasn't going to work. She was going to have to convince him. The other theme that I felt was um, complexity. I just felt like they managed to portray Bonnet's nuance and realize that he's, it's like, you know, you're not all evil or you're not all good. There's a little bit in between and it's just this continuum. It's just a matter of where you fall on that continuum, be it Jamie, Claire, Epi, you know, Wiley, any of them. And so I just felt that um, this showed all the people and where they fell on this continuum and not necessarily just in this episode but even episodes before like Forbes um you know Ulysses um you know uh, Jocasta although she generally tends to stay about the same um but you know Claire and and um you know Bree just everyone um seemed to show what their moral compass was in this episode mm. yeah good point I like that. I do too. Yeah. I have to say that I um, 
I didn't see uh, big themes in this episode. I saw a story play out that was fascinating and riveting and um, creative and engaging until the end mm -hmm. when she shoots him. And then looking back over the story, because I didn't know how it was going to play out in the, in the episode. I certainly knew how it was played out in the book, but I didn't know how closely they would stick with it. But then in the end, uh, she didn't, Roger didn't row her out in a boat and she stood on the shore and shot him with her long rifle. And then, you know, Roger poses the question. And, and there's been quite a bit of debate on Twitter since uh, Diana said, well, she did it out of mercy. And the title suggests that that is what the intent is, but I don't get that from the story entirely. I think it's more complex than that. In the book, I do think she acted out of mercy. There was no chance he was gonna get away. There were people all over the place watching him, you know, and being aware of what was going on. There were crocodiles in the river. He wasn't gonna get out and she gave him mercy so that he didn't drown to death in that, uh, you know, the terror that he had of that. But in this one, I don't think they were able to build that kind of situation where I felt like she did it just out of mercy. And my thinking is, is that she, there was a little bit of everything involved in it, in her decision. There was mercy. There was, I don't know if vengeance is the right word, but justice I think would be and then there is the finality of making sure he could never come back and do anything about her little boy again. Mm -hmm. And I think that may have been the most important reason why she stood on the shore and took his life. Mm -hmm. So looking back on it, I think the, when I look back at the whole story that came through in this episode, I think it was building to that point so that we could see what forces were playing upon her for her to make that decision and why she never answered. It was complicated. Carmen, do you think that given her motivate, the reasons for her motivation, that protecting her child would have definitely over or superseded any mercy she would have felt for her? It would for me. Yeah. Yeah, if I thought he, you know, he's already gotten away multiple times. That's mm -hmm. true. And it, the, the people left, so there weren't, you know, any witnesses when she shot him. For mm -hmm. all she knew, his crew could be waiting down the bay with a boat to come and get him off of there and take yeah. it and, mm -hmm. and carry him off. And if it were me, I would have done it for that very reason alone. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have even worried about mercy or justice at all. I would have just made sure that he could not ever touch my child. Yes, I also protection. thought there was an echo of ja what Jamie said on the beach to him when he said, the last face you see will not be of a friend. Mm -hmm. And that's the last face he saw was Bree's face. Mm -hmm. It was not a friend. Yeah, so they de they definitely did subtly change that from the book. Mm -hmm. I think they did. That's a good pointing out of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, but I do think that Mercy was definitely in the book. Part of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. In Mercy was not. Yeah. I mean, because it, it, you know, it relates to Jamie telling her that killing him is not going to make her feel right. better. That mm -hmm. forgiving yes. him is going to make her mm -hmm. feel better. Yes. Can I just add to what you said, Carmen, though? That part of the yeah, book sure. always bothered me. Which part? The fact that she killed him out of mercy. Mm. I just felt like it was just seemed so demeaning to have a storyline where a woman who had been raped by someone had gotten to the point where she felt merciful enough to kill him. Well, again, and that leads to my big theme, I think Diana being a, a devout Catholic and mm -hmm. someone who really practices forgiveness on a daily basis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, that is a way that Brie is liberated mm. 
from what he did to her mm -hmm. and doesn't have to carry that with her. Mm -hmm. So I think she sees that as a, as a redeeming, you know, a redeeming and a strength of something that is, uh, gets us through life. It's a mm. tool. It's a, you know, a, a skill, um, a practice. Mm. And, uh, that was my big theme is basically what Claire says, um, when someone is in need and you can help, then you help. Mm -hmm. And it's not always fiscally. It's like, can you find the forgiveness to liberate yourself and be compassionate to the other? And do you remember Jamie does that in, um, yeah, with blackjack. Black with Black Jack when his brother dies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, in the book, he walks him, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, away not, from his, the yeah, death of his yeah, brother and he shows mm -hmm. compassion for him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so those are, those are Christ-like themes that run through, uh, Di the, that are threaded. They're, they're just mm -hmm. all over Diana's books. These, you know, obviously Jamie kills people. He kills for his family. There's a very clear code and it's not catholic um no but forgiveness is part of that and i think that's a theme in this episode um compassion and uh not just forgiveness but mercy and compassion you know jamie helps roger by using restraint and letting him find his manliness in the seven in the 1700s that's that's good um to find his pride, Ulysses helps Jocasta um, by killing someone, but it's it's his puts his own life in danger because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but he's protecting her. He's protecting her. Um, yes. He's helping her, um, even though it's certain death for him to do that. Yes, even to lay hands on that guy. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Claire helps Epi. Epi helps Claire. Bree helps Bonnet. Young Ian lets that slime bucket on the beach leave mm -hmm. instead of shooting him. Um, so that's true. I feel like that theme of Diana's of, of, or, you know, just what Claire says, if you can help someone, you should, mm -hmm. whether that's financially or out of the, you know, big of your heart or forgiveness or compassion or mm -hmm. uh, whatever. Uh, to me, that mm -hmm. was the theme. Mm -hmm. Good. That's interesting. I mean, I mean, picking up on what you said, Courtney, forgiveness is not really about the other person. Forgiveness is really for us. You know, it's for us because if you if you know if you hold things in your mind and in your heart that have been done to you, you are held bondage to that. You know, and the and the person whoever did that to you still has some element of power over it. Or power mm -hmm. in your life. So, I mean, that theme of forgiveness uh, running, as you say, runs through, all, runs through the books and it is not so much that you're doing it um, out of piety or because you are, um, you are such a super religious person, but because it is needed for you, the survivor, the person who has been hurt in order for you to take back the power and be able to move on. And then, and she goes a step further to actually be loving to that person. Now, obviously, if it's someone you love, it's someone in your family, of mm -hmm. course, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. But even, you know, I don't know, there's love thy enemies. You know, it is, it is the healing of the individual mm -hmm. and the world. When we talk about love thy enemies, in this context, is not some kind of emotional love that people tend to associate. You don't have to like the person. You don't have to have the woman. Mm -hmm. I want to go hug them. No. But to recognize their humanity. And so mm -hmm. they don't continue to be, to be monsters. Mm -hmm. Just mere flawed individuals. Yeah. It's like all of us. Is that some people's flaws are more destructive to the others around them. Mm -hmm. But when you can give them back their humanity, that in itself is love. 
yes that will allow you to forgive them because they don't seem that monstrous and that you know so all powerful and take up that position in your head that there is just this something out there that is just too big and too awful when you reduce them to flawed humanity then you can forgive them and then you mm -hmm. can yeah because what forgiveness is, is a releasing it's a releasing mm -hmm. of them yeah. exactly so what is that saying if you if you're angry with someone it's like drinking poison and expecting mm -hmm. the other person to die exactly yeah. so yes. yeah yeah my my theme weirdly from this episode was um was all about family because we saw the Fraser Mackenzie family, you know, come together to solve this threat to their family in the form of bonnet. So we saw that cohesiveness, that love, that I'll have your back, you know, whatever you need, I'll be there. And then we have bonnet on the other hand, trying to manufacture a family mm. force. You know, he's so lacked an understanding of what brings people together and what forms family because he, he has never experienced it. So he thought that if he had, if he had elements, you know, a man, a woman and a child that he could create a family, you know, and the fact that he had to be doing it by force and trickery didn't, it didn't mean anything to him because he thought once he had that in place, then he would have the family. He had no clue. I thought the juxtaposition of the Fraser Mackenzie clan being so tight and being there for each other as against Bonnet's attempt to manufacture a family, you know, was for me, that was one of the themes in terms of, you know. That was good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's what I came I up like with. I like that too. And then I think it's the other theme that you see is that uh, class and money are not the same thing. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. No. He was putting on clothes, trying to pick up manners, trying to get a mm -hmm. house with all of his rich furnishings and everything. Kind of like a, one of these, um, there's Lottie a, winners? no, there's a crab oh, that, that decorates its shell with all kinds oh, of yeah. little things that it picks yeah. up. Is it a crab or is it shiny? And it it uh, it he reminds me of something like that that he was just trying on things because he thought this would would do the trick. He could never escape who he was. No, yeah. uneducated, savage, low. There's a fine <laughs> line between narcissism and sociopathy. Yes, yeah, there and, is. Yeah. And he really crossed into it. I don't think he was so much of a narcissist. I don't think he was a narcissist. I think he's, he's a sociopath. I well, he's he a sociopath also. also. A Definitely yeah. a sociopath. But narcissists, narcissists believe their own delusions. They believe yeah, they their do. lies. They're that's very true. delusional. So, yeah. um, and it's all about them. Yeah, yeah. that's true too. So, right. And they're very charming often. Yes. <laughs> narcissists oh, can be often very charming. Very charming. To show how delusional he is and how well uh, Ed acted the part, the way he was, it was clear when he was sitting at the table, he was trying to figure out if she was telling the truth or not. He didn't quite believe her, but he wasn't quite sure. But the way he behaved then, and then the way he behaved in the room with, when he was selling her, it was like his feelings were hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and he saw, you saw that when she kissed him and they, and yeah. He had so much hope, and then he, he was. But he was like, so. I mean, oh, she's his, playing me. His acting, his acting in this episode was just. He was phenomenal. definitely a standout. I yeah. mean, definitely a standout in this episode. I, I saw the charm was facile. It was just on the surface. Yes. Evil was just right. Mm -hmm. You see, I couldn't. I can't get past the evil. That's mm -hmm. the thing. because the yeah, evil you see the was evil. So palpable. The evil was so palpable that I could not get past it to appreciate his, his, his charms. Just well, you knew, for me, I don't think it was evil. It's more that you knew this guy was going to pop any second. It's mm -hmm. like the, the he's like a he loaded is. spring all yeah. the time. 
It was just right there, just right under the surface. You want to, we want to remember that he was so charming in the beginning that Jamie let him go. Yeah. I don't think it was his charm that made Jamie let him go. It was not his charm. It was because um, what's his face said invoked all the oh he's a friend of Gavin's and Gavin said you'd never let a friend. It was Jamie's stupid um perverted sense of honor. Yeah. So let's do standouts. Ed was a standout for me. Epi was a standout for me. Sophie was very good in a lot of the episodes. She was very good. I think this was one of her strongest performances. I think, it, I think she was restrained enough. It wasn't over the top. It wasn't histrionic. But sometimes her more big emotional scenes tend to verge on being over the top and histrionic. This was a little bit, this was more reserved in the parts where she was good. She wasn't consistently good, but when she was good, she was very, very good. So I'm going to make her a stand. Ed Spielers, uh, definitely. Again, uh, Epi, the woman who played her, uh, Leah, you said? Leah Shine. Leah Shine. Said. Leah mm -hmm. Shine, uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um... The writing was a standout. The music was standout. Mm -hmm. The costumes were standout. Oh, yes. But um, I think the scene development, the way the story was woven from beginning to end was perfect. And I'm glad they ended it the way they did. The ending stood out for me as well. Because yeah. so many, often they do things, and I'm like, they should have ended it there. Why did they keep yes. going? And this time, I felt like, okay, they ended it at the right spot. At the right spot, yeah. Yeah. Well, my standouts were Ed. He's the biggest standout to me. <laughs> and then Sophie, I echo what you said, Antoinette. I think she's getting better. And I think this was a good episode for the most part. I thought Billy Boyd did a great job as Forbes. Yes, true. Um, I thought Colin McFarlane was a standout. Um, and the creepy guy who was going to buy Brie. Uh, I was... Mm disgusted Howard. by him he was his his hands nasty. look like he has circulation issues <laughs> uh, pawing all over her and sticking one of those nasty fingers in his her mouth i thought um leah shine was really great um, i thought stephen bonnet's lair was a standout and i thought the music i noticed you know when i went back and rewatched. The music was especially good. Yeah. And I love the way that Bear has themes for all the characters, mm -hmm. particularly when I do interviews, because I usually put them at the beginning. <laughs> oh, neat. But, yeah. Um, if you look at my interviews, I, I choose the music based on the character's theme. And sometimes it's before the character has a theme, so I have to go dig and find it. But that's one of the things I enjoy. Well, I, I'm going to uh, repeat the, uh, the refrain now. Um, it's a chorus because I think my, the standout Ed uh, uh, was just superb. Epi, right up there, you know, I mean, think about a part like that and making yourself shine in it. Yeah. You know, she was just, <laughs> I was just so impressed with her. Um, I thought that, uh, Sophie, I, I agree with what's been said. I think there were, there were parts in it where she did extremely well, uh, and, and amongst her best acting so far, uh, Claire was, I thought, terrific. Um, the music, one of the things that I really was touched by was the flow of the water as in between pictures mm. of bonnet you know of the water you could see the tide you know or i was imagining it was the tide coming in and i thought that 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 was really well done uh mm. and the geese uh flying through the air i thought had a plaintive addition to you know geese calling or it, she diana writes about that quite a bit in her books and how plaintive their their sounds are and it seemed appropriate for the for the outcome what a wasted life
I too loved the costume week. I just thought, yeah. wow. I just, even Ian in his suit, mm -hmm. he looked really sharp. And in the music, and I liked um, the uh, beach scenes of the dunes with their, with their grasses and, and so forth. I thought that that was really, uh, really added to the story. So those were my standouts. Mm -hmm. All right, I have to go eat something. All right, <laughs> see you guys. All right, you guys go eat. Okay, I'm gonna go. Okay, see you. you guys. Bye, I love you. And go to sleep. Be good. <laughs> no it's more drinking. That's impossible, Carmen. <laughs> my good days are over. <laughs> she hung up on you. <laughs> Bye, love. Fatty boom boom, Let me tell you something. I could look like a mouse and I wonder I bring. I wouldn't stop trying till I drop down there. Never let your big size fool you. The cooler day I become. You think you're better than me, but me better than you. You think you can handle me, but I can handle you. But love is not a mission or a competition. But I'm me come first and I you come second. I would look like a mouse and a one dollar brain. I wouldn't stop try till I drop down there. Never let your big size fool you. The cooler day I'll be cool. You, you, you know.